Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Beyond MVSE, Looking Towards the Next Evolution in Systems Engineering. My name is Katie, I'm the Communications Manager here at Vitech, and I will be your host during today's presentation with David Long. For over 20 years, David has focused on enabling, applying, and advancing model-based systems engineering to help transform, transform the state of systems engineering practice. David is the founder and president of Vitech Corporation, where he has developed CORE, a leading systems engineering software environment. He co-authored the book, A Primer for Model-Based Systems Engineering, and is a frequent presenter at industry events around the world. A committed member of the systems community, David is president of the International Council on Systems Engineering, which is in COSI, a 10,000 member professional organization focused on sharing, promoting, and advancing the best of systems engineering. Before David gets started, I do have just a few housekeeping items. We will be answering questions today at the end of the webinar. Please send your questions in as soon as you think of them throughout, through the question tab on your webinar control panel. David will insert as many questions as he can today, but if we don't get to your question, we will reach out to you after the webinar. Our webinar is being recorded today, so if you experience any connection problems during the live presentation, a recording will be available by request within one business day of the live version. The recording will be published to Vitech's webinar archive located on our website. I'll send the link out in the chat window. I'm now going to turn the presentation over to David. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Very good. Thanks, Katie, and thanks everyone who took time out of their busy schedule to attend this. It is always good to take the opportunity to talk a little bit about the profession, where we're going, and how we better serve our customers and our ultimate stakeholders. Before I really get started talking about looking beyond MBSC, one note. I know many of you may have received the product launch announcement from Vitech earlier this week about the upcoming launch of Genesis 4.0. If you tuned into this webinar hoping to hear about Genesis or any other Vitech product, I'm sorry to disappoint you. This webinar is really about the state of the profession and where we are headed. It's not about Vitech. It's not about any specific product. If you would like to learn more about Genesis, the launch webinar comes up next Thursday, so T minus six days and counting. With that, all the Vitech stuff I'll put to the side, and let's start talking about beyond MBSC, looking towards the next evolution. If you've been around the profession of systems engineering, if you've been to any systems engineering event over the past probably eight, nine years, this is the hottest topic. It is the topic that perhaps 25% of the talks and papers are about. The only thing that's even close to it is system to systems. If you talk to practitioners across the industry, it is clear that if you look at the innovation adoption cycle, we're beyond early adopters. We're in the early majority. I don't know that we have hit the tipping point but we are clearly there. If you look at the Gartner hype cycle, some argue we're at the peak of inflated expectations, some the trough of, in, of disillusionment, some hope we are on the slope of enlightenment. Regardless of any of that, it is very clear that the profession will adopt model-based systems engineering. So it is now time to start looking beyond that, to take a holistic look, to understand where we're going and how do we best navigate the transition to and through MBSC? Now, to talk about where we're going, we need to set context. As systems engineers, we always need to understand the context of the problem so that we solve it appropriately. We should talk about MBSC to make sure we understand what it is and what it isn't so that we can do that appropriately. We should talk about what MBSC enables us to do better than old approaches as individual practitioners and as a profession. And that, I believe, sets us up to talk about what the next evolution is. And so let's get going. In setting the context, the best piece of context I have is what Incozi published in June of 2014, A World in Motion. This is SE Vision, Systems Engineering Vision 2025. Not a vision for Incozi, but a vision for the profession. Where are we? What's the state of the challenges today? What will the state of the challenges be 10 years from then? And how do we need to evolve? It's not a detailed roadmap. It instead is a challenge piece. And for those who haven't seen it, it's publicly available on the Incozi website. It's a very good piece on systems engineering in the future. Out of that piece, there is a beautiful chart, a beautiful graphic 
developed by JPL. Over the past 18 months, with many audiences I've spoken with around the world, I reference this. And unfailingly, we resonate with it. Now that's disappointing because everything listed here is a challenge and we would rather resonate with successes, but it really reflects the environment that we need to respond to. Regardless of where you go to in the world and you're talking about systems issues, we recognize mission complexity is growing faster than our ability to manage it. And by the way, so is technical complexity. That gives us a chance to keep pace, it gives us a chance to solve the problem, but complexity is growing and growing rapidly. As much as we would like it to be otherwise, we know system design more often than not emerges from pieces rather than architecture. So what do we have? We have systems that are often brittle, difficult to test, complex, expensive to operate. I don't know anyone who has ever gone to their customer and said, good news, I'm going to deliver you a system that is brittle, that wasn't well tested, is complex, and is hard for you to operate. That's the antithesis of what we want, but that's what we have. We know that if you look at project lifecycle phase boundaries in a given project, from conceptual design to detailed design, to detailed design to production, production to fielding, and so on and so forth, we lose knowledge, we lose investment at every phase boundary. Not an effective way to run a project. Moreover, we know that if you look across projects, within an organization or across the profession, we lose knowledge and investment. In other words, we just do not learn the way we need to. And the fifth, I always refer to as, well, systems engineers and program managers should be in it for the same thing, which is delivering the capability that the customer and the user need, but we just don't work and play well together. As systems engineers generally focus on technical figures of merit, as program managers focus on budget and schedule, we begin to conflict more than collaborate. That is one set of challenges, but there's another context piece that we have to remember. We have to remember that our environment is changing. Systems engineering emerged in a time where we were developing long-lived, relatively stable, electromechanical systems, often aerospace and defense, we were generally doing top-down engineering into greenfield. We were not deploying into existing environments, and we were doing standalone systems. Well, we know this does not rep represent the state of the practice today. We know that systems engineering is being deployed in many different fields. No longer is the best of systems engineering purely in aerospace and defense. Some of it is in automotive. Some of it is in energy. Some of it is in medical. Some of it is in aerospace and defense but the application is broad. We understand that no longer is electromechanical the primary implementation technology. We have passed through in the 90s the age of software intensive, and we're now at the age of cyber physical. 50, 60, 70 percent of the capabilities are implemented in software. That needs to be reflected in how we apply systems engineering. And we're certainly not standalone. We're certainly not interconnected. The buzzword of the day is Internet of Things. It is about interconnectivity. It is about big data. It is about applying that in near real time, if not real time, to deliver the capabilities we need. So if we truly want to respond to those, those challenges, we must do so in this environment for SC. It is aerospace and defense and automotive and transportation and energy. It is cyber physical. It is brownfield. In other words, we're doing a lot of re-engineering and deploying into existing systems. It's middle out. It's interconnected. It is varied lifespan. Some are very short lifespan. Some are very long lifespan. And it is about change. It is about change in user expectations, change in technologies, change in requirements. It's a changing environment for systems engineering. And therefore, this is the environment we need to recognize exists for MBSC and that which is to follow. If we understand our environment, then let's talk about MBSC and let's talk about building a solid foundation in order to improve both the ultimate destination and the journey. Lewis Carroll and Alice in Wonderland famously wrote, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. Now, once you do know where you're going, let's at least consider taking a straight path to get there. 
What I'd like to talk about here is do a little demystification and demythification. There's a lot of misunderstanding about MBSC, and I think we can improve the journey if we clear that up. Clarifying some things, and then removing roadblocks towards our adoption. Certainly, if you've talked about MBSC, certainly if you've been around Incozy, you have undoubtedly seen this chart. This chart was developed by Incozy. The earliest versions probably date to about 2008, 2007. And it's a very simple graphic that depicts a practice in transition. Systems engineering moving from the left, a traditional document-centric approach, to the right, a future model-based approach. And this is a very, very simple graphic. You would think that we would have a common understanding of it. But interestingly enough, sometimes the simpler the graphic, the greater the misunderstanding that emerges. So let's demystify. Let's demythify a little bit. That simple graphic has given way to two key myths. And those two key myths are perhaps some of the most damaging aspects in the journey to model-based systems engineering. The first is, if we're talking about transformation to doc, from document-centric to model-centric, well, clearly that implies models are new. Nothing could be further from the truth. And that thought in and of itself probably creates more fear, uncertainty, and doubt in the transition than anything else. Models are not new. Models are fundamental to the way we have always and will always do engineering. It's the way we think, it's the way we communicate, etc. So then what's different? Well, the difference is the centricity and the clarity. Models have always been there, but they've been secondary information. They've been descriptive. They've been in the background. We want to move them from the background to the foreground. So models certainly aren't new, but we're talking about bringing them to the foreground and making them the key point of emphasis as we do our work as opposed to secondary artifacts. The other myth that has grown up around that graphic is that documents are going away. They're not going away, they're simply moving from the foreground to the background because we know that models give us a higher fidelity way to think and communicate. That being said, documents are a wonderful communication mechanism with a very wide audience and we need to communicate with a very wide audience. So as long as the documents and the models are not disjoint and disconnected, there's value in both. Documents will fade to the background a little bit, but they're still a key tool in our toolbox. Now a few more myths that exist. First off is the concept that diagrams somehow are a model. They're not. They're extremely important. They're ways we communicate. More often than not, we draw pictures as engineers. And diagrams, whether they are SysML diagrams or traditional structure diagrams, does not matter the representation of choice, are very, very important. But diagrams are not actually models. They're views of a model, simplified views from a particular viewpoint. So that representation set is a toolkit, uh, sorry, a, a tool in our toolkit. But a stack of diagrams, a stack of SysML diagrams, does not necessarily represent a model. The other thing is, we have for a quite long time been doing modeling and simulation. Modeling and simulation in systems engineering is not model-based systems engineering. It's a critical tool, it's a critical technique, it's key to analysis. So if these aren't MBSC, what's different? Model-based systems engineering is about integration. It's about connectivity. It's about coherence. It's about these models and more, or these representations and more, being interconnected to give us a true, consistent, coherent picture. So a series of SysML diagrams that are truly driven by an underlying model, those are views of a model. Modeling and simulation that are detailed analytics in support of a greater architecture and analytic model, those are part of the toolkit. So if we talk about then models, I find this graphic helps me communicate and understand. There is this amorphous model that exists behind things. Now if you're talking about CAD, that's pretty easy because you understand its points and vectors. For us, it's far more ambiguous. 
So why do we, we use views? We use views to construct, to visualize, to interact, to analyze, to communicate, to present, because views drawn from a specific viewpoint allow us to see subsets of this very complex system model and think about just those subsets while maintaining a bigger context. And by the way, diagrams, sorry, diagrams and specs and tables are also legitimate views. So that document that we used for years is a view of a model and we're trying to make that model more explicit in the journey. To summarize, demystifying and demythifying, models aren't new. They're central to the way we do engineering. They've always been there. We will serve ourselves if we frame this rather than a transformation than as a natural evolution. We're moving from low fidelity representations captured in documents to higher fidelity, richer representations. And why do we want to do it? That better granularity of knowledge capture for management, analysis, learning, and improved communication. So let's stop framing this as transformation and start framing it as evolution. MBSC requires integration, connectivity, and coherence. A series of diagrams is not a model. They may be a representation of a model, but they're not a model. Models in SE using models or modeling and simulation in SE is not equal to MBSC. It's important, but it's not the same. And we use views because that is the way we construct, communicate, and analyze. They can be fit for purpose. They absolutely should be fit for purpose. If we get rid of some of the mystique and some of the myth, now let's clarify. The next question is, if we're going to do model-based systems engineering, which model base should we do? And if you recognize that question, then you are well ahead of most people in industry. I honestly did not recognize that question until I attended an event in June of 2014 and realized I was one of many people in the room that were talking about model-based systems engineering, but we were talking about distinctly different things. And ultimately, there are at least two points, but in reality, there is a system model continuum. If you are part of INCOSI and you attend those venues and you attend those events and you contribute, then what you most frequently hear about are what I frame loosely as architectural models. What's on the left, what we frequently represent in SysML. This is where we innovate. This is where we have a chance to get a hold of complexity. This is where we build in res uh, resilience. This is where we do new innovative thinking. If you talk to somebody in product line engineering, if you talk to somebody from the product lifecycle management community, and you hear them talking about model-based systems engineering, what they will be talking about most frequently are high fidelity analytic models, oftentimes physics-based, sometimes not. Those are also legitimate system models, but they are two different models. There's the architectural model for innovation and creativity. There's the analytical model for rigor and fidelity and efficiency and effectiveness. What we need to recognize is, depending on the type of problem that we use, we fall somewhere on this continuum. New problem, unprecedented, we're going to do more architectural. If it's product line, we're going to do more analytic. But these are not disjoint. There is one and only one architectural model with multiple viewpoints, and the analytical models hang off of that, quite frequently off of the physical model. Now, I think we understand the analytical models very well. Most of us are trained as engineers. What is harder to visualize and harder, harder to understand is the architectural model. So let me try to clarify that for a moment. If we talk about the architectural model and we look at what is the foundation of systems engineering at the most basic level, I think we would see that requirements serve as the basis of behavior or functions. Behavior is allocated to the architecture, the logical or the physical. And by the way, we should extend this to also include test and evaluation, validation and verification. If I weren't doing PowerPoint engineering and I had more space on the screen, I would show a fourth bubble. So this is the most simple interconnection of 
the concerns in systems engineering. Well, we know a classic systems engineering technique is either decomposition or aggregation, depending on which level you're going, which direction you're moving. And so we have child requirements. We have decomposition of our behavior. We have parts list and interconnectivity of our architecture. And we know at lower levels, those are also interconnected and interrelated. So at the simplest level, you could call this a model for MBSC. But this is far too simple to actually be valuable. A real model for systems engineering, or at least the start of a real model for systems engineering, looks something like the following. Now, this isn't the only meta model or the only schema for model-based systems engineering. There are others. This is simply illustrative to communicate some of the scope and breadth. Most of the words that are on this diagram you will represent. But to be a good model, you have to have the concepts like requirements, functions, components, interfaces. Their interconnections, requirements serve as the basis for functions, functions input, output, they're triggered by items, functions, uh, components perform functions, etc. Those all have to be defined. And by the way, each box on this screen obviously has additional information. Requirements have properties or attributes that you care about. S different set for components, different set for functions. And by the way, there are concepts that I don't even have listed here risk, etc. So you can start to see that there's this big underlying meta model, data model, schema, pick your word, that underpins the modeling that we do. And you realize very quickly that you cannot effectively engineer a system thinking at this level, communicating at this level, which goes back to why we focus so much on views and diagrams. The views and diagrams are simply a representation of that underlying model from a particular viewpoint to meet a particular need. So we've talked about, clarif about myth, mystique. Hopefully we've clarified a little bit what is a model. Let's talk about some roadblocks. Because as I talk across industry, I've heard a lot of really great reasons why we can't adopt MBSC. And I'd like to set those aside quickly. So why can't we adopt MBSC? Well, first is, well, MBSC requires SysML or UML or UPDM or UAF, fill in the blank. And everybody on our team must learn that representation in order for us to adopt MBSC. No, absolutely not. If you want to use SysML, if it's well suited to your problem, please use it. Same for UML, same for UPDM. But MBSC is about moving to higher fidelity representations, higher fidelity models. We've got a library of them to choose from. Pick the one that suits your organization. We're already doing SysML or UML or UPDM or UAF. So we're already doing MBSC. Well, maybe you are, maybe you're not. If you're doing true coherent MBSC and you're using that as a representation set, perfect, keep doing it. If you're just drawing pictures and you're not concerned about coherence and consistency, you've got a problem. We're already doing modeling and simulation. Great, keep doing it. That's a part of MBSC, but that's models in SE. We have to implement it all in order to get any benefit. No, not at all. You need to implement the aspects of MBSC that serve your project and your problem. Are you doing unprecedented engineering. If so, you're going to do heavy architectural and lightweight analytic. Are you doing a precedented system? Then you're going to do far more analytic and probably far less architectural. It's too complex. Well, it's too complex if you do believe that you have to do everything. If you do believe that it requires you to fundamentally change your toolkit. If you understand that it's evolutionary and moving to higher fidelity representations, higher fidelity models, it's actually not complex at all. We have to model everything and it's not possible to model everything. The first part of this statement is absolutely true. Sorry, the second part of it is absolutely true. It is impossible to model everything, but we don't need to model everything. We need to have a coherent top level, level zero architecture of our entire solution, of our entire problem, and then we go into greater detail where there are more unknowns, where we're dealing with new technologies, 
where we're dealing with changing requirements, where we're dealing with risk. So the granularity on our model is extremely different. Don't model everything. It is a classic trap in MBSC. Implementing MBSC as one size fits all, again, absolutely not. It's a tool in the toolkit, adjust. It's a technical problem. It's not a technical problem. It's actually a cultural problem and an organizational change problem because we're changing the way we represent and communicate knowledge. That's actually far less of a technical problem. There are technical challenges and far more of a cultural one. We have to avoid tool lock. Tool lock is a myth that vendors have created. Don't buy into it. MBSC is the answer. It does everything. No, not at all. MBSC is part of our journey as systems engineers. It is a aspect, a method, a tool. It's not more than that. So the transition, again, it's about making models explicit, models for communication and analysis. I put it in that order because systems engineering is so much about communication. The model is design and specification. Done well, it ensures consistency and a connected source of truth, and it's far more evolution than revolution. If we have made the journey properly and we reflect back to the challenges, the problems that we're trying to solve and address, well, here's what we've done. We have a better toolkit to address mission complexity, but that's about it. We have started to touch upon system design and given us better design pieces. We've given us a sense of connectivity and a chance to begin to handle knowledge and investment across project lifecycle phase boundaries, but we haven't solved two and three and we haven't touched four or five. So let's start plotting the journey beyond MBSC. Now let's assume that we understand it. We assume that it's part of our corporate and our personal toolkit, part of our professional toolkit. How do we ourselves and our organizations leverage this to better address those five challenges that we all see across industry? Complexity, intentional design, knowledge across project lifecycle boundaries, knowledge across cross-project learning, and the SCPM divide. How can we better use MBSC? What benefit does it give us over document-centric techniques? Well, perhaps the first is actually the ability to align and respond with reference architectures. Over the years, we have worked with a particular uh, vendor, a, a particular contractor in the aerospace and defense domain. And they do a number of UAVs. They do fixed wing UAVs, rotary UAVs, underwater. They do sensing platforms, they do weapon delivery platforms, and they applied model-based systems engineering techniques to all of these. What they realized one day was if they stepped back and looked at it, in reality, they could elicit a higher level common reference architecture. It was always there, but it was simply easier to see in model-based systems engineering. So they took the time to do it. Now, model-based helped them see it, but once they captured it in model-based systems engineering, they got four key benefits. First is alignment of the current team. They aligned around language. They aligned around concept. They communicated better within the bounds of a given project team. When a new project started up, they had a much faster start. They got beyond the blank sheet of paper problem. When they looked across the family of systems, they had greater alignment. They had stability of the functional architecture, incredibly stable, independent of what type of UAV they, UAV they were dealing with. By the way, that also allowed better injection of new technology. And fourth is enablement of feedback and learning. They had a reference architecture Every time they completed a project, they had the opportunity to look at the architecture for that particular UAV and determine should they feed it back into the reference architecture. This is perhaps the first place that we can get real gains because the reality is we like to talk as systems engineers as if everything that we do is a brand new problem of different type. The reality is most of us work inside of organizations that develop, develop specific types of systems. Philips develops 
healthcare systems. They may have the technical expertise in that area, but it's not likely that they're going to start building aircraft anytime soon. Vice versa, Boeing has tremendous technical expertise. It's not likely that they're going to cross into healthcare. We work within particular product families. So reference architectures are, ex are exceptionally valuable. Next is product line engineering. Now this is one of the areas that honestly aerospace and defense does not do particularly well and that's quite natural given the lifespan of our systems. We just don't iterate quickly enough and that's okay. But if you are in a domain that has new generation systems coming out frequently, maybe every year, maybe every two years, maybe less than a year, then you can take lessons from automotive. You can take lessons from software. And here the benefit is if we have an explicit model and we have done the clear communication and the clear analysis, now in product line engineering we're very heavily on the analytical side. So we're doing more refinement. We have more clarity, more fidelity. If we are trying to inject innovation, we can see the impact of that much better. And so through the higher fidelity communication, we align quicker. Through the higher fidelity analytics, we can see impact better. And so if you're doing product line engineering, you can do it far better with model-based techniques than document-centric techniques, which effectively force you back to ground zero at every step. As a profession, we know that we cannot exist in a top-down, build-everything-fresh mentality. Now, we know that we're doing primarily middle, outer, bottom up. We know that we're going into brownfield rather than greenfield. But we still, if you look at our tools and techniques, our processes and methods, we still have this build fresh to atomic level mentality. That won't work. We have to move from custom built to composability. Now, system of systems engineering allows us insights into that because it's about not interfaces, but it's about interactions. It's about yielding new capabilities. How does model-based help here? Well, model-based helps because, again, it's a better representation, a higher fidelity representation, but we can also deal with the composability of the root models themselves. If you're trying to compose a new system from existing subsystems or existing components, one of the first things that you can do is try to compose the system model from the existing subsystem models and look for those interfaces, look for those interactions, look for the gaps. Model-based systems engineering enables the composability of the bigger model and the analytical thinking that's required for system of systems, Internet of Things, and ultimately, the transformation we have to make from custom-built to composability. Systems engineering is part of delivering the capability. We understand that as systems engineers, we have a couple key roles on the project team. Yes, we are champions for the holistic mindset, but we are also glue. We are communication glue. We're not the most important people on the project, but we are translators that reside between customers and users and stakeholders and systems engineers and software engineers and subject matter experts. We are also the technical connectors there, not only communication but analytic, so that we can do trade-offs and we can understand if we need to make this trade-off on weight, how does that affect us in power? How does that affect us in thermal dissipation? Not that we have all that knowledge, but we connect to the subject matter experts that do. If you're going to connect across model-based engineering, we need to recognize that many of these specialists already have their own engineering models, and we're not seeking to transform them. We're seeking to connect them better. Communications and analytics. Model-based engineering can be a higher fidelity connect, sorry, model-based systems engineering can be a higher fidelity connector than classic documents. Now to do that requires that we define language and concepts, and that's semantic. 
That is difficult. What we've done today, and there are lots of frameworks on the market, lots of standards that are all about syntactical connection. That's good, that's an enabler, but that's just syntax and that's about structure. To get real communication, to get real connectivity of concept requires semantic mapping. This comes back to the concept I said earlier. There is one architectural model, and that is actually the model to coordinate all the other models. It's not that there's one model that can ever subsume every system characteristic of interest. There's not. But there is an architectural model that can connect them and provide coherence. Today, that exists in document-centric, low fidelity. What we need is that to exist in model-based, high fidelity. A couple more points. We have to accelerate. We know that we have to accelerate. If you go around the U.S. and you ask how many people are still doing waterfall, no one says that they're doing waterfall, or very rare exception. I will say there's a time or two, and there's a time or two that you should do waterfall because it's tuned to the pace of change of your requirements and your technologies. But the reality is waterfall is still embedded in our team structures and our processes. Well, waterfall is tuned to stable requirements and stable technologies, i.e. the environment of yesterday. It is not tuned to changing technologies, changing user expectations, changing needs, the environment of today. And that is where agile or agile concepts come in. There are a lot of people who believe that agile and systems engineering are inherently in conflict. They're not. And in fact, Agile can be very well enabled by good model-based systems engineering. Because the first step in Agile, if you understand Scrum and you do Sprint Zero, it's about laying in your middleware. Well, fundamentally, laying in your middleware is about laying in your top-level architecture. And then you progressively bring pieces of the capability into focus, into being around that architecture. You can do exactly the same thing with systems engineering. If we do not accelerate to meet the pace of change, and we cannot do it with documents, we can only do it with models, we will be irrelevant. As much value as a profession as we bring, we will be irrelevant. As Jan Bosch told us, for those who attended the International Symposium in Seattle this year, by the way, if you didn't, go to the Incozy website, Spend 40 minutes listening to his talk. It's there out in the public. It is probably the highlight of the symposium. Jan, in a very compelling talk, said, look, we've got to do two things. If you want to be relevant in this age, we have to incorporate feedback quicker. Feedback from the environment, that's about Internet of Things. Feedback from our customers so that we evolve to deliver what they really need. We have to learn. And we have to get beyond this concept of built to last and instead recognize we must build to evolve. Our systems in an environment of change have to be evolving and we have to deliver new capability quicker. Well, how do you deliver new capability quicker? You do your analytics quicker. How do you do your analytics quicker? You leverage more powerful models. You expose them in higher fidelity ways. We keep coming back to that concept, and that concept is key to why model-based systems engineering enables a better future. The last thing I will say is, if you are making the journey to model-based systems engineering, if you want to do it well, be a systems engineer. Recognize that the change that you're trying to engineer is actually a system itself. There is a classic failure mode on how to fail at the adoption of model-based systems engineering, and that is to see all of the promise, the architectural, the analytic, to see how big of a change that this can make, what this can enable, and try to do everything. The moment you try to do too much, what you will do is you will trigger the immune response in your organization because you will be representing too great a change and change is threatening. 
And so instead, apply systems engineering concepts to how you want to deploy model-based systems engineering if you want to be successful. Engineer the deployment. How do you do that? You understand your context and you draw your context boundary. What goes inside that boundary? Your change agents. Your project where you have a champion who is willing to allow you to do new things. And then you scope the MBSC you want to apply to that particular problem. Now, what do you do at the boundary? You recognize that you have existing interfaces into your enterprise, and you honor every interface in both content and format. Why do you do that? Because you turn your system of change into a black box. The rest of the enterprise doesn't care. They just care that they get what they want in the format that they need. Now, that may make us a little suboptimal in the MBSC, but it makes the adoption of change optimal, and in fact, the engineering optimal. If you want to be successful, apply that. Everything that I've talked about so far is what you can do, what your organization can do. But let me talk quickly about some things that require more than you in your organization. They require the greater profession, and then we will talk about beyond MBSC. Here's where we're going. Here's the journey that we're on. It's evolving our MBSC capability as a community because to truly make this transformation, it's not good enough if one practitioner does it. It's not good enough if one organization does it. Ultimately, we need the supply chain to do it. And we do have a roadmap for where we're trying to go. Standards and metrics and architectural models integrated with analytics, theory, ontology, and formalisms, et cetera, et cetera. And so we're trying to move to install institutionalized practice across academia and industry. This can't be done by any one organization. It has to be done by a profession in, com in combination. Now, the block on defined theory, ontology, and formalism is very critical. That gets back to the meaning and the semantics. What we must do as a profession is we have to make sure that we have an ontology, that we have a language, that we have these concepts. And by the way, when we have them, we don't have them for model-based systems engineering. We have them for systems engineering. So it actually enables the greater practice. And in doing so, we enable communication, we enable analysis, we enable learning, and we enable far more. You may recognize this picture as the Rosetta Stone. Why do I show the Rosetta Stone? because systems engineering is about connecting so many different people. The stakeholders, the users, the subject matter experts, so that we look at a problem from multiple perspectives, we understand the trade space, hopefully we open up the trade space and we solve from multiple viewpoints. We have to enable communication across all those people for us to be successful. We need language and ontology for that. If we want to learn and learn across projects and across domains, we need to recognize that transportation and energy and medical and device and aerospace and defense speak different languages. We may have the same underpinning concepts, but we speak different languages. It is a fool's errand to try to get all those groups to speak the same language. We need a translator. You cannot have a translator without an ontology and Rosetta Stones. And by the way, we need an ontology to unify our profession. This profession of systems engineering, this profession of holism, is at risk of fragmenting. There are those who focus purely on process and think systems engineering is only about process. There are those who think only about systems engineering management techniques. There are those who think model-based is something completely different. They're not. These are all perspectives, all tools. And so we need the ontology to connect us to connect the different practitioners in the engineering and project life cycle, to pr connect the different fields so that we can learn across effectively, and to unify the profession. The ontology can come without MBSC, but the ontology of MBSC makes it easier. Now, this was about communication, but there's something else I said about model-based systems engineering. It's about representing knowledge in a more granular format. And if we will put it in that granular format with semantic meaning, which is what happens when you do an ontology, we have the opportunity to learn. Because we can now apply big data. We can go to our friends in academic, 
academia and we can learn and we can develop heuristics and wizards. Most of you will recall a time of Clip It where Clip It would knock on your screen and it says, hey, looks like you're trying to write a requirement spec. Can I help? Now, Mike Clip It never did this, but he certainly could because effectively when you're writing a requirement specification, you're doing the same thing as writing a, a memo. You understand you have certain content that you need and you're putting it in certain locations. Well, that's just data capture. I don't need Clip It. My problems are far more complex than Clip It. I need Einstein. I need Einstein to say, hey, Dave, it looks like you're trying to achieve five nines of reliability. Would you like me to help? Absolutely, I would like you to help. Hey, Dave, it looks like you've just done a terrible job of allocation. Would you like me to help? Well, I don't appreciate being told that I just did a terrible job of allocation, but I'd rather know it now. It turns out that what I'm talking about here is heuristics, applied lessons, and this is all possible. We can get some of systems engineering analytics from art that is captured purely in the heads of extremely seasoned practitioners down into automated rules if we will expose our knowledge in granular formats and enable learning. We can do this, and we can do it in the next year or two. It's on the very near horizon. Now, when I talk about heuristics and wizards with my friends in academia, they tell me, Dave, you're shooting way too low. What we need to talk about is the grand theory of systems engineering, and I violently agree with them. We do need a grand unifying theory of systems engineering, and I do believe it's out there. I also believe that it will be discovered long after I leave the face of the earth. So ultimately, heuristics and wizards can help me today. There is something that can help me tomorrow, and that is connecting the supporting theories. If you listen to the community, in the past year, Systems engineering has moved from talking about discovering the grand unifying theory of systems engineering and instead started to focus on the fact that many of the methods and processes and tools that we employ are already underpinned by strong theoretical basis. But we don't connect them the right way. We don't expose them the right way. We can do that and we can make a meaningful difference in our practice and our execution just five to ten years hence. How do we do that? We do it through models. Why through models? Because they expose knowledge in the granular way and they are about connecting semantics. And if you want to connect supporting theories, you're connecting semantics. So theories, wizards, ontologies, the roadmap for the greater profession, those are all things that we have to undertake as an entire body. And certainly that's something that Nkozi and others are trying to do. So that brings us to the end. You've hung in long enough. It's time for, for me to share at least what I believe lies beyond MBSE. Anytime you peer into a crystal ball, you have a chance of being right, you have a chance of being wrong. But if I'm going to peer into the crystal ball, I'm going to look at our sister professions that have already made the leap to model-based techniques. And so I ask myself, Mechanical engineering, we don't talk about model-based mechanical engineering anymore, do we? We talk about model, we talk about mechanical engineering, but we know it's underpinned by very strong models. They made the leap. We know the chip design is done by model-based techniques. You could not design a modern chip by old techniques. So if I look to CAD, if I look to mechanical, if I look to chip design, if I look to electrical, what can I learn? What came after they meet, made the leap to model base? And the answer is they got back to doing mechanical engineering and stopped focusing on CAD. It was a tool in their toolkit. They got back to chip design and electrical engineering. They stopped focusing on the technique. And so part of what lies beyond model-based systems engineering is getting the focus from a particular tool and moving our obsession beyond that to delivering the value. Now there is a qualifier here because there is something that is very important that does lie beyond MBSC and it has a great opportunity for engineering and societal impact. 
and that's actually model-based engineering. If we join our engineering colleagues who have already made the leap to model-based, and we do it in the right way, then we can enable the model-based engineering lifecycle, and therefore that does lie beyond model-based systems engineering. Now, there are some that believe that through great semantic mappings and great additive technologies, that we can one day print the successor to, to the Joint Strike Fighter. Well, whether you believe that or not, we can absolutely connect the engineering life cycle. And how do we do that? We do that by being that communication and technical glue and take that architectural model that we care about and connect it in high fidelity ways to the existing model expertise that exists in all these other domains of practices. So we take our emerging model-based approach and we tie it semantically into the subject matter expertise into their models. We don't try to convert them, we try to connect to them. In doing so, model-based engineering can be what follows in BSC. So, if we turn the attention back to ourselves for one moment and ask the question, after model-based fades away, what remains? Well, we are left with an enriched toolbox for communication and analysis, more scalable techniques, more tailorable techniques, heuristics through learning, reference architectures that we can leverage, composability, insight into the efficient frontier of trades, toolbox of theories that support us, higher value, progress in our journey as systems engineers. Fundamentally, after model base fades away, we are left with systems engineering with greater efficiency and effectiveness. Systems engineering with clearer theoretical underpinnings, with a defined ontology. Systems engineering with rigor. Systems engineering with stronger foundations to carry us forward. If we move beyond the thought of transformation to MBSC and look at this instead as an evolutionary step and look at the greater journey, what lies beyond model-based systems engineering? It is systems engineering. It is the point in time where we move our focus away from a particular technique, as valuable a technique in our toolbox as it is, and restore our focus on the purpose of systems engineering, which is delivering ultimate value to the customer through the system of interest in an efficient and an effective manner free from unintended consequences. If we remember that that is the end point in the journey, then we can move beyond MBSC and deliver tremendous value for all. Thank you. And with that, Katie, we will open it up to questions. All right, thank you very much. We have gotten a few questions, excellent questions. The first one is from Arash. He says, ISO 42010 says a view is a collection of models. But here it's suggested that each model is a view. He says he's a little bit confused by the suggestion. What is the benefit of having each model as a separate view? Well, I appreciate the question. And so, Arash, the, a, a view and a model are two different things. Um, a view is actually a subset of a model viewed from a particular viewpoint. It is a reduction of the information to focus on a particular analytical piece or a particular communication piece. And so what I believe you're reading as you look at that is go back to my concept that says there's one architectural model and there are many analytical models that underpin that, that are connected via that. I think those are the multiple models that they're talking about and a view would give you a slice of that. Now I do not believe that there is anything called a requirements model. I don't think that's a valid concept. I think requirements are a viewpoint, a problem-centric viewpoint into the greater model. And then a requirements diagram or a hierarchy diagram or a requirements table would be a subset of the requirements information presented in a particular way. So we do need to separate this concept that a view and a model are somehow the same thing. A view is a picture. It's a subset of information for communication purposes, maybe a little analytics. 
All right, thank you. Uh, the next one is from Lyle, and he asks, the requirement architecture model looks very similar to diagrams. Can you explain the difference? So the, the model, if we go back to that somewhat complex, somewhat wicked picture of requirements, sorry, requirements, components, links, functions, operational architecture, all that, that is a picture of a data model. Now, that model, to be a valid model, has to pass the test of an ontology. Each concept on there must be defined. Each interrelationship must be defined. Now, that picture is a picture of the data model, but actually the data meta model. What you would need to do then is to populate that with information about your system of interest. You would not have one requirement block on that model. You would have 10, hundreds, some people would argue thousands, although I don't believe that's true at a system level. And you would then have all the interconnections. So then what does a particular view do? What's a particular diagram do, view, sorry, diagram do? For example, a requirements diagram would take the requirements, maybe the functions and blocks related to it, maybe the tests related to it, and show just a subset of the requirements that are part of your system. So we can have a picture of the meta model, of the data model, and that's what that big picture was. But the moment you start populating it, then it becomes too complex to visualize unless we subset it through views. All right, thank you. Um, we do have three more questions that we have time for today, and I think that these are important ones, so we're going to go ahead and do these. Uh, if you do have to go, I, uh, if you guys have time, please fill out the survey that will pop up on your screen when you leave. Um, but I do want to go ahead and get these questions onto the recording, so I think they're important ones. I've got a question from YL. He asks, can you give any examples for successful interconnection between the analytical models and the architecture model? How can I do that in a tool such as Core? Okay, um, the first thing is to recognize that the interconnection requires two things to be successful. It requires syntactical mapping and semantic mapping. So how do you do syntactical mapping? Well, the best way to do syntactical mapping is to use something like an OSLC or another framework which is really about defining how data is passed. It's about structural information like XML. Um, if both tools on both sides of that support it, then you have your syntactical connection. If not, you may need to do point to point. The second thing is then semantics, and this is the harder bit, because this is where you have to ensure that your concept in both tools is the same thing. Because if you do syntactical mapping without the concepts mapping, it's worthless. Now what could you do? If you take an architectural systems engineering tool and you take an analytical tool, let's pick something like a MATLAB Simulink. You could have an existing high fidelity model in Simulink of the way that your existing sensor operates, for example. If you've got a high fidelity model that's already built out at, an engine, at a detailed engineering level, why rebuild that at the system level? So your system hierarchy, as it drops down to a lower level of fidelity, you can have your system model eventually connect over to your MATLAB simul Simulink model. And then if you've got an executable architecture, then as you execute that architecture, you would like it to seamlessly then call the existing Simulink model, generate the performance results, the timing, et cetera, whatever characteristics you need, and pass it back. I can, in this context, it's best to simply frame it that way. What you need to determine is you need to align that to your system of interest and the analytics that you need. Tell the user stories that you want, but realize that any time you try to do it, you need to have the syntactical connection, and there are some standards for that. It's also point to point, but then the semantics are the key. All right, thank you. A question from Manuel. Uh, he asks, do you think that it's possible to use agile methodologies like Scrum in some parts of the system lifecycle? I, I absolutely do. 
Um, you have to be very, very careful. You have to be very deliberate. But one of the best descriptions I ever heard about Agile was Agile is all about matching the design process to the pace of change, the change that is occurring in your requirements, your user desires, or your technologies. So what does that mean? That means Agile is highly inappropriate in certain aspects, such as the time that you start bending metal. It is highly inappropriate in certain high-fidelity, long-lived systems, for example, nuclear weapons. I prefer you not be overly agile there. I need a little more system assurance there. But when you're dealing with particularly software-intensive systems, once you've got your architecture laid out, I think agile and scrum and sprints are completely applicable and not only are they applicable, I believe we need to move to embrace that thinking where appropriate or we will be irrelevant. All right, last question for today. Uh, this is from Eric. He's asking what work is being done by Incozy and various vendors that are out there to make MBSC models and domain or physics-based models more interoperable? No, that's, a, that's a great question and thank you for tying that back. Um, for years, Inc COSI has been doing very good work on the model-based systems engineering front, but I will tell you that I think we have been a little too inward looking. There are others who have been working in this same domain. For example, if you're familiar with BIM, that is Building Information Model, that's in the construction industry. I mentioned earlier PLM, Product Lifecycle Management, that is led by SIM data, C-I-M-D-A-T-A. -A. What INCOSI is doing now is actually embodied in one of our five-year strategies. The strategy says INCOSI should accelerate the transformation to MBSC. How do we do that? We do that by rather than just INCOSI or INCOSI and OMG working together, it is about bringing more people to the table, BIM, PLM, perhaps one or two others, to have the real discussion about model-based techniques, model-based representations, ontologies, so that that group of five or six can really define what is necessary to enable model-based engineering. We will not get it all in the first pass. There are more stakeholders and more perspectives than what I just laid out, but in a bit of an agile approach, get the first cut right and then expand and go again. It's going to take time. It's a journey. But if you happen to show up to the INCOSI International Workshop just two weeks from now, you will, instead of watching INCOSI talk to itself, instead of walk, watching INCOSI talk to Object Management Group, hopefully you will watch INCOSI and OMG be part of a dialogue with those other players. It's a key point in the journey, and I'm, it's one that I'm pleased that we're undertaking. All right, thank you so much. Excellent questions, everyone. Um, you will see that David's contact information is on the slide uh, that's on the screen right now. If you have any additional questions, you can also post your questions or comments about today's presentation on our LinkedIn group page. If you just visit LinkedIn.com and search for Vitech Corporation, that should show up for you. You may have to request membership, but I'm on the other end of that, and we'll be able to get you uh, joined in on there. If you haven't already, uh, we do recommend that you go ahead and save your spot in our special live reveal of Genesis 4.0 happening in six days from today. Uh, we do have limited spots for that presentation, and they are going fast, so we wouldn't want you guys to miss that. You can also stay up to date on all of our upcoming webinars by visiting our webinar calendar on our website. And uh, you can go find that by going to vitechcorp.com and clicking on services and then webinars, and that will get you to our calendar. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us, and we hope you have a wonderful day.